Guys, I've got the most exciting news ever. I've just hit a thousand subscribers, so thank you so much. So before we start this video today, I just wanted to let you know that I'll be doing a thousand subscriber special next uh, next Wednesday. And if you've got any questions for me, I'll be answering any questions you've got. Pop them in the comments section below and I'll add them to my list of questions. Now, let's kind of look at that Rover. Hi guys, it's Steph from My Driver Classic and today I'm back. I had some amazing feedback on the Austin Rover Montego so I got offered a Rover 827 and I couldn't help but say yes. And I'm so excited to take you out in today's video and we're going to show you around the car, show you the inside, show you a little bit under the bonnet as well because it seems very advanced for the age of the car and then we're going to take her out for a drive and see what she's like. So stay tuned because we're about to hit the road and what I can only describe as one of the nicest Rovers I have ever seen. I cannot believe that I'm taking out a Rover 827. It feels, well, it feels like a bit of a strange flashback to childhood, really, because I feel like there were a lot of these cars around when I was a kid, and now it's a car that you just don't see anymore, like a lot of your 80s and your 90s cars that were once prevalent across, you know, the roads of Britain and beyond, and now you just don't see any of them at all. And, um, as is custom, I did a bit of digging before uh, before I came and had a look at this car, just to see what I could find out. Because uh, I do, I will be honest and tell you, I didn't really know much about these cars. It's a bit, um, it's a bit modern for me, if I'm honest. Um, now I got in touch with Alex Sebinger from the Rover 800 Club, and he was incredibly helpful. So the first thing he was able to tell me was he'd actually owned this car himself, and he owned it in 2011. So he was able to tell me quite a bit about it um and great news i'm able to share some of that information with you so um i'll tell you a little bit about the history of the car as we drive around but a little bit of tech for you this car is a mark 1b and it's a us spec now one of the interesting things that alex did tell me is that they did improve the build quality as the cars were developed and um this isn't you know one of the first off the off the production line so it is actually a very nice car and as you've probably had a look round as we go round the shot lines on the door are great all the panels have been fitted very carefully this in my opinion is probably one of the best examples that we're going to see and um I was also told this is an SI, which is an entry-level 827, whereas your Sterlings and your Vitesses were your more high-end, high-spec. And um, another little fun fact for you, we are going to look under the bonnet and I'm going to show you the engine. So let's have a look under the bonnet. Now, if you think this looks a little bit more complicated, then you are probably right because it doesn't look like a standard BL setup under here. And that's because, and I'll tell you a little bit about it as we go through the video, this car was manufactured um, in conjunction with Honda. So it's all, um, the engine under here is all Honda running gear. And this particular engine is a high compression because it is a pre-cat. It looks good under the bonnet. It looked good on the walk round, but what's it going to look like inside? Now, I don't know about you, but I am not disappointed by this whatsoever. I mean, look at all these controls. It's crazy. I also love that Rover-esque flash of fake wood on uh, the doors and dash. It's something that um, I had in my Metro, actually, and I absolutely loved. Now, as I sit in this car, it starts feeling quite modern, actually, compared to some of the other cars of the era. In fact... Um, if you look at some of the later cars from BL, as you go through the 90s, it's, it wasn't upgraded that much at all. It's, you know, for its time, it's incredibly modern. It's very well laid out. It doesn't feel over the top. It doesn't feel too ostentatious. Um, in fact, I quite like this, car, this era of car for their layout. I mean, there's enough, there's enough modern junk going on so that you can drive it every day and you can keep up with your modern traffic but it doesn't feel like that out of touch edge that you sometimes get with a modern car where it feels like you're driving a spaceship now i'm also going to show you the back too because there's some incredible leg room and it seems a shame not to show you Maybe I'm getting old, but I love a good bit of legroom in the back of a car, and this really doesn't disappoint. In fact, in a lot of modern cars, you aren't getting the same sort of enviable amount of legroom. And as you can see in the back, it's all very attractive laid out. You've got your headrests, and then you've got this thing, which is a table come separate the screaming kids in the back thing. Anyway, I really love it, and I think it's high time we started the car, and then we took her out for a drive. Now, this is one of my favourite sections of the video and we're going to try starting the car up. 
So let's have a listen. You can't even hear it. It's, I can't believe how quiet it is. It's one of the quietest cars I've driven. And I would say it's very comparable to a modern car actually, which isn't really surprising when you remember that it is a Honda engine under the bonnet and not something BL. Guys, it's the dreaded situation that I seem to get every time I get in a 90s or late 80s car is that my hair is sticking to the roof. There's so much space around me, but there's not much space above actually. Um, but hey ho, we're going to take the car up for a drive and it is so nice in here. Everything about this car is very luxurious, as you've probably already seen on the walk around. And all I can say is, is I think it's going to be a really fun drive today in what most people would consider kind of a bit of an unassuming car, but one that I think is definitely classy then and classy now. Guys, today um, I'm out in this Rover 827 and I've been driving it for a little while now and at first I was like, oh God, it's an automatic, I don't know how I'm going to be with it, but I absolutely love it. It's amazing it's like a modern car it's a very strange experience and not one i was expecting at all and i feel like this car has been totally undersold to me until i arrived and what an absolute pleasure to jump in a car to find it's easy to drive it's got great visibility and it seems to have everything that you would want in a modern car but it's attractively packaged in this beautifully old shell and I really like it so far. So I'm gonna carry on chatting to you as I drive around. Um, but yeah, so far I'm very impressed. Guys, as I always talk about with the Metro and I talked about in the Montego video as well, one of the biggest issues with cars of this age and of your 80s cars and stuff like that is the fact that parts now are pretty much obsolete. So I was chatting to the owner and he said that he, just like me with the Metro, like I've been going on about how I can't get an exhaust, he wasn't able to get an exhaust for this either so it's now running a stainless steel exhaust and keeping cars running like this i mean there's from what i gathered from looking on howmanyleft.com there's less than 150 of these cars left in the uk and that's across all marks so like mark one mark two less than 150 and that is i mean it's an absolute it's i feel like it's a crime because these cars are amazing and it keeps up with modern traffic it's absolutely rapid and yet you can't even get the automatic transmission fluid for this can you imagine a car made in the last 30 years we can't even get a basic service part i personally think that's absolutely criminal and guys a really interesting fact that the owner of the car was telling me is that in the late 80s they took a production car they took an 827 onto the isle of man tt track so you may know that if you're into motorbikes and stuff like that if not you might want to look it up because i know some of you guys are tuning in from abroad and uh, they took this car they took it production car and it was the first car to do the track at an average of over 100 miles an hour and it was the fastest as well and do you know what? I bet it was in absolute luxury because this car is so nice to drive. It's amazing. Now, if you're in any doubt as to the quality of Rover or to just how amazing these cars actually are, the police, so the UK police, drove these as their cars, these amazing 827s. And I can see why, because they're incredibly fast. So we've been driving it around um, as, per, um, as per Friday night in any in any town or city across the UK. Traffic's not moving very fast, but it is straight off the light. I'm driving an automatic, which, you know, isn't my favorite, but it's it's almost, it's almost convinced me that an automatic is okay because the box is so smooth and as you change through the gears, it isn't like straight to the next one, straight to the next one. It feels like a very smooth graduation through the box. And um, I would say for the age of the car, when people got into this, they must have felt like they were driving such a modern car because the steering is so light. I mean, I've driven stuff of a comparable age. Um, I mean, there wasn't much between this and the uh, between this and the Montego, um, and it's it's incredible, really. Like it's it's the steering that's so light. It's the suspension. I'm not feeling all the bumps in the road. It's how quiet the car is. It's how responsive the car is, and. Again, it makes me so angry that there's so few of these cars left because I don't see what people's obsession is in chasing, you know, the next modern, most luxurious car. Because to be quite honest, we're all on a budget and this is a great car for a budget. I mean, you know, the cost of these cars is going up and up because people realize the value of them because they are a nice, comfortable, luxurious drive on a very comparable budget. Um, 
you know, the only stick in the mud is this parts availability nonsense. And I just think it's, it is a real shame. And it, I talk about it every time I take out a British Leyland car that has been completely undervalued in the second-hand car market is that these cars, you take them out, they are you get a lot of car for your money. I mean, the owner of this car, you know, didn't pay very much at all. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been, it, I mean, would you believe this car's lived in a museum? Well, you would believe because it is a very nice car and it isn't rotten and it isn't rusty. But this really flies in the face of everything that people say about British Leyland cars. Like, I'm forever hearing people say, oh, British Leyland. But these cars are brilliant. And the more British Leyland cars I take out, the more my view solidifies that they did create amazing cars. But they just didn't market them properly and they didn't follow through with a consistent approach to really shouting about how great these cars are and I think that was the biggest failing of British Leyland it wasn't the cars at all I think it was mismanagement and I think it was mismarketing because this car deserved so much more than what it's got and there should be so many more left on the road because it's honestly it's I don't keep saying it but it is a great choice for someone who needs a daily and they like a bit of comfort and they like all the mod cons of a modern car but don't fancy to the price tag guys i've been told i'm allowed to put my foot down so we're just waiting at the red light now and uh i don't think i've ever i don't think i've ever been so excited oh, here we go let's see what it's like and there we are I hit 40 straight away and this is what I'm saying, it's such a cool car. And I did not expect this at all. I, and I'm so guilty of this, I keep judging books by their covers. I thought the Montego was gonna be a bit drab. I wasn't too sure about this. I wasn't like, oh God, it's gonna be, you know, super sporty, exciting experience. And yet again, I have proven myself wrong. So I think I need to stop being so judgmental about some of these cars, because this car is cool. So before I come and take a car out, I always do a bit of research because people always say, how do you know about this car or how do you know that? Well, I always do a little bit of swatting up before I take a car out to make sure that I can do it justice because in my earlier videos, I kind of would just approach it and I would really go for it and be like, oh my God, and then I'd forget things. And so I did a bit of research before I took this car out and I sent a picture to a friend and, um, he said oh that was my car actually and it was this particular car so he was able to tell me a little bit of history and um one of the most interesting things was and one of the most shocking things is is this was actually uh at one point not too long ago um sold for scrap and again it's that throwaway society attitude because this car's great and um so it's been up for scrap it's lived with different people it's been in a museum it's lived all over different parts of the uk it's lived in scotland so um it had its first owner for 20 years and then it's done a little bit of moving about since and um yeah it's been it's been owned by all sorts of people but thankfully it seems now to have ended up with a rover a rover diehard who uh is going to take good care of it and i think that's what a lot of these cars need isn't to be run into the ground or forgotten or scrapped or put into a museum it's it's to be taken on by enthusiasts who do want to keep them running every day and who do want to, you know, get the best out of them before we get to this point that actually I don't think we're very far away from and I don't like to talk about is that the parts are so scarce that they can only be, you know, special event cars. And um, so, yeah, so I feel very lucky to take this car out today because it has been a very pleasurable driving experience and uh, it's definitely a car that I'd want to drive again. Now I know I've been talking about how this car feels very modern and um, I just looked down and I spied that the mirrors and the windows are all on electric controls. For the age of the car that is absolutely nuts. Like if you think about cars that we all drove, you know, our first cars and stuff, it was all wind down windows, manual, move those little mirrors about, certainly was in my metro. Now this is like, everything seems to be electric, everything seems to be super modern and again it's just that it's just those little touches that make it really comparable with everything you know the little modern luxuries that you would like in a modern car or something you know that's not too old and um yeah i think it's uh, i think it's really nice and again it's like you look at cars from the early 2000s and some of those are still on wind down windows and they don't have the luxuries that you have in this car which is why i find it absolutely mind-boggling that you would go and pick something else and not this because it just seems to have everything as I had already alluded to at the start of this video, the Rover 800 series and the Rover 827 
wasn't really a car that I knew too much about. It's a lot more modern than what I'm used to. I'm more of a 60s sort of girl. So I just want to give a big thank you again to Alex Sevinger, who gave me, you know, some really great facts to go off, some good information on this particular car. And, you know, it's those owners who have the passion to share what they know and all the different things about the cars that make these videos what they are. So thank you, Alex, because um, you were incredibly useful and helpful. Now, back to this amazing car so the 827 sits within the rover 800 series which you won't be surprised to know was an executive car range from austin rover now you could have got within your 800 series an 820 an 825 an 827 or if you're a bit posh and you were going for the top of the range you could have gone for a sterling or a vitesse now, I've already alluded to the fact that this car has links with Honda, and that's because it was designed and built in uh, in conjunction with Honda. And it, you might say, well, how did they split it? How did they decide what they were doing? Well, Honda provided the engine, the gearbox, both manual and automatic, or as some of you may know it, the transmission and the chassis. And BL stepped up, they provided the four cylinder petrol engine and the electrical system. And seeing as nothing has gone wrong in this car today, um, I'm going to give BL 10 out of 10 for the electrics because there are quite a lot on this car. Now, they sold it abroad as well, they sold it in America and the American ones were made in Japan, I like little facts like that and um, the, the cars that were sold in England were manufactured at Cowley which is where they made the Morris Minor as well, my favourite car and this car was designed by Gordon Sked and you might be saying well I didn't know that BL worked with Honda, I didn't know that at all. So you'll probably be very, um, very interested to know that this wasn't BL's first time with Honda. They'd already, um, they'd already had the Triumph Acclaim and I've actually got a Triumph Acclaim in the works. So if you haven't subscribed already, I would because there is a Triumph Acclaim review coming very soon. Now, I do like to talk about, you know, production and things like that. And these cars were made for a long time. They're made all the way up to 1998. Production peaked in 1987 and um, unfortunately a perfect storm caused everything to kind of start going downhill in 1991. There was a recession, people were hanging on for the facelift at the end of 91 and the car declined, you know, not rapidly, but it declined to a sad state of affairs in 1998, last year of production, where just over 10% were uh, manufactured. Um, compared to its peak year of 1987 which is you know a sad a sad end for this car now i wanted to catch up with the owner because i wanted his opinion on what i can only describe as one of the most luxurious cars i've ever driven yes yeah, the the 800s they're um they are one of my favorite sort of attainable classics you know they're uh, they're not stupid money yet and uh, you do get a lot of car for your money um they're uh, I'm not quite sure why I like them. I couldn't tell you because there are prettier things, there are faster things, there are more reliable things out there. Um, I guess it's just the, um, you do get the heritage of uh, Rover, you know, being really the last great British car manufacturer to finally shut its doors um, in, uh, in 2006. There is that. Um, and also, they're a little bit, maybe not hated, maybe hate is a strong word, they're a little bit underappreciated. And I kind of like that in a car. It's, it sets it out um, from sort of the other modern rubbish. And I think they've got an unfair reputation. And uh, anything I can do to sort of balance that is uh, is fine by me, you know. Well, it's, um, I think these cars should be saved because um, at the end of the day, there are not many left. It's, they've, they've gone through the stage that all old cars go through, where the, the bangers before bona fide classics. But, um, of course, they're... Um, they are on the way up, you know, it's, it's I probably paid um, top end money for mine, um, but then again, it was a relatively straight example with 12 months MOT, which had done, you know, probably 13 miles a year for the last five years. Um, it's, uh, I'd say go out and try and buy the best one that your budget will allow, like with any classic cars, um, but this, they certainly deserve to be saved because, I mean, people remember them from the childhoods like I do. Um, they're, uh, they are a good car, no matter what engine you get really, even the 825s, which of course had, a, um, had uh, the typical rover problem of uh, head gasket failure. Um, they're, uh, they're, just, they're just cracking well-sorted cars, and they don't really get enough credit for what they are really. 
it's uh, you know they are they are good cars, very 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 good cars, and they do they do deserve to be saved. So yeah, well, it's, um, I think it probably is because my mum had one. Um, it was sort of when I, when I was a kid, we had um, we had two or three Rovers, but sort of uh, the one that I remember most, um, she had a, a Mark II 820 um, four door saloon. Uh, it was a midnight purple with a beige leather interior, and of course, when you're six years old, it was just the best car in the world. And it's, uh, I sort of came about this one. I was looking for a Mark II actually. I'd saved up a bit of money, and I wanted a classic I, I could sort of run on the daily. Um, and I was looking for a Mark II coupe actually, but then this sort of it popped up on eBay. And I thought I'll stick a bid in because it wouldn't go for anything I'd be able to afford. But of course, then it did, and I found myself driving down to about 30 minutes south of Northampton uh, just to pick up um, the uh, you know this this amazing car and luckily it was all right it's been bought on scene and it's touch wood it's been uh, it's been spot on ever since Guys, my Rover 827 experience is coming to an end and what an experience it has been because this car is everything I didn't think it was going to be. It's been fast, it's been fun and you know what, it's yet again one of those cars that people look at, make assumptions and don't look inside and it's, honestly, you're missing out. This car's amazing and you should definitely try one out if you can. Now, I really hope you've enjoyed watching this video as much as I've enjoyed driving the car. If you have, don't forget to hit like. Any comments you've got about the car or the channel in general, leave them in the comments section below and of course don't forget to hit subscribe because new car videos go up every Wednesday and every Sunday. Now until next time take care and drive safely.